All right, welcome back to part three of our video series where we are creating Glacier Race using Scratch. As you can see in the top left right now, we have created the game so far with one car. And we've got some snowballs and some collision events thrown in so we can have a crash and spin out. What we want to do now is add a second car to our game. Okay, so before I do that, I'll just quickly save as a copy because I'm using the online ver version of um, Scratch. I'm just saving that game up. Now what I'm going to do first of all today is bring in a second player. Okay, and the way we're going to do that is bring in a second car which is going to be blue. So over here we've got the red car in our sprite library. All we need to do is right click on that and duplicate it. And you'll see we get two cars on our screen. I'm going to hit the information symbol above this red car too and I'm just going to rename it to blue car. And I'm going to go to its costumes and change its color. Just using the fill bucket. It's quite simple, just choose a light blue to go on top, a little bit darker, and then a darker blue for the base color. So it's something simple like that. And just go back to your scripts and you've got yourself a blue car in the game. Okay, now to get this blue car working, all we have to do is just modify some of the script that's already in there from the red car. And there's not much that we have to modify. The first thing is the start position. At the moment it's going to start in the exact same position as the red car and if I press the green flag it looks like the blue car disappears but in actual fact it's hiding underneath the red car. So what we need to do is just change where it says when I receive setup, go down to the X value, change that minus 40 to 40 and that's basically going to make him pop out over here just a little bit to the right of the center of screen. There we go, so that's our start position now. So we've got our blue car set up in the right starting position. So that's all good. What we can do now is uh, start to make him move independently from the red car. Okay, and the way we do that is just change our car controls down here. At the moment we're using W, A, S and D to move the red car. What we want to do is use the arrow keys for the blue car. So if we look over here, the A key is moving left. So let's change it to the left arrow. Over here we've got key D, that's our right arrow, W will be our up arrow, and change the key S to be the down arrow. Okay, so that should have moving independently. The other thing I want to do, is over here where it says define spin. When he spins out and re or assumes his new start position at the bottom of the page, it's right over here exactly where the red person or the red car starts his new position when he spins out. So if they have a crash at the same time, they're going to start on top of each other, which is not what we want. So in the blue car here, when he spins out and he stops spinning eventually, we need to go to X equals 40, not minus 40. Okay, so now when he spins out, he'll start just off to the right here a little bit. Okay, so if I crash them at the same time, they both start in different positions. Okay, so that's working nicely. Um, actually, that's pretty good. I think he should be moving pretty well. I'll just move the arrow keys yeah, up, down, left, and right's working fine. You can see that I have collisions with the red car. Whoops, hit the side wall then. I have collisions with the red car and nothing happens. Okay, so what I want to do is actually make it possible for our cars to bump each other around the page and they can knock each other off the track. So, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the red car first of all. And we're going to find this big chunk of code that says check collisions. Let's move that out of the way for a sec. So at the moment we're looking for collisions with the snowball, road one and road two. What we want to now do is check for a collision with the opposite car. So because I'm on the red car sprite, what I'm going to do is go to my if if then statement in the control tab and bring that out. And we're going to check by sensing whether or not we're touching the blue car. So if the red car is touching the blue car, then we're going to broadcast a message. Okay, so bring out broadcast a message. Now the message hasn't been created yet, so you need to make a new message, and it's going to be called bounce. Okay, so basically if our red car touches the blue car, we're going to broadcast a message to our game that we're going to bounce these cars off one another. Now that bounce isn't going to do anything yet because we haven't defined what that bounce should look like. Okay, so what we're going to do is Stay in the events tab and bring out another chunk of code that's called when I receive bounce. So make sure you change that drop down box to bounce. A few things are going to happen when we bounce off each other. First thing, just change point towards 
and we're going to point the red car towards the blue car. And then we're going to turn 180 degrees, so it's basically going to start turning the car to make it look like it's had a bit of a collision. But it's only going to last for 20 steps, which is a really short amount of time. So the car is basically going to flicker a little bit when it hits the other car before we point it back in direction zero, which means straight up again. Okay, so that's all the bounce is. When we hit the blue car, we're going to do a little flicker for 20 steps, as if it's going to turn around a bit, and then point back in the direction it was going. So let's try and run into the blue car. See it having a little bit of a flicker there, just as it hits it. Okay, that's trying to turn 180 degrees, but because it's um, moving for 20 steps, which isn't very long, it doesn't make that full 180 degree turn. Anyway, that's pretty straightforward. What I might do is just duplicate that bit of... Actually, no, I'll make the code from scratch. We've got to make that code again on the blue car now. So go over to the blue car sprite and just move that defined spin out of the way so we've got check collisions up the top here. Just like before, now that we're on the blue car, we're going to go to the control tab and bring out an if then statement. And we're going to check if we are touching the red car. So if the blue car is touching the red car, like before, we're going to broadcast a message called bounce. Okay. And we're going to do the same code pretty much as before. So when I receive bounce, so when I get the message, I've had a collision. This time I'm going to point towards the red car. Oops, wrong one. So point the blue car towards the red car. Turn it 180 degrees. We'll start to anyway. Move it for 20 steps in that direction. And then we're going to quickly swing it back around so it's pointing straight up. Okay, so now when the blue car hits the red car, we should get a little bit of a flicker as well to show it's had a collision. And you can see that it's actually knocking it out of the way now. So let's go and have a bit of a fight here between the two cars but to catch up. So the red car can hit the blue car out of the way and make him crash. Or, whoops, the blue car can hit the red car out of the way and make him crash. Okay, so it's quite fun with two players now because you can actually bump each other around and make them run into snowballs or the edge of the page. You can fight them for gems. It's actually getting pretty cool. So, as I just said, we've got to fight each other for gems. I haven't put the gems in the game yet, so we might as well do that now. Now, to put the gems in the game, we're just going to make a new sprite up. You can draw your own gems if you want, or you can create one from one of these ones that's already made. I'm just going to use the ball again. I think it's probably the closest thing in Scratch that looks like a little gem. Okay, when it comes in, a little bit too big, so use your shrink tool to shrink that down, make them kind of hard to collect. Something like that. It's probably a good size. Okay, and you want to rename that sprite too. So hit the little information symbol and change it from ball. Call it gem. Okay, now once we've got that gem created, we're going to go over to our data tab here and make a couple of variables. First one's going to be called red car gems. Now put the spaces between these names. I don't know if that's a good practice or not, but let's just roll with it and we'll see if everything works. If everything works, then let's stick with it. Because I want it displayed over here on the screen. That's why I didn't want to put all those words together. Okay, so we'll have red car gems there. And we'll make another variable called blue car gems. And click OK. And just move them up to the top left hand corner of your screen so they're out of the way and everything looks neat and tidy. Basically we're going to be counting the number of gems each car collects because as I said earlier on in the series that the car with the most gems at the end of the game is our winner. Okay, so we've got to keep a tally there somewhere. Now we're going to add some code to these gems to get them set up. So in the events tab here, bring out the message when I receive setup. So when they're told from the game loop to get set up and get ready for the game to start, what we want to do is make sure these two values are set to zero. Okay, so they reset each time we start the game. So we'll set the red car gems to zero and set the blue car gems to zero. We also want to make sure these gems go to the front so they're above everything else. And we also want to hide them. Like the snowball, we're actually going to hide the original gem sprite and we're actually going to create clones of it. So we're going to have multiple clones appearing at different stages throughout our game on the track here. Okay, so to bring those clones on, we're going to go to the control tab here and choose when I start as a clone. 
Now, a bit like before with the snowballs, we're going to have them appearing at random locations on the screen. So in motion, choose to go to X and Y values here. For the X value, we want these gems to appear anywhere along our X value. Okay, so let's go to operators and tell it to choose a random location on the X value. So minus 200 to 200. Y value will be 180. So the gem will be starting at the top of the page, just anywhere along the X axis. Alrighty. The other thing we want to do is make these gems change colour. So it keeps our game a little bit more exciting. So lots of different coloured gems will look kind of cool. So we're going to go to our looks here. And you've got the option to change the colour effect. Now if you change it by 25, it's just going to be the same colour still throughout the game. It's going to change slightly from this yellow, but it's always going to be stuck at that um, new colour. So what we're going to do is go into operators here and get it to pick a random colour. Okay, so we can choose any number between minus 100 and 100. And that's going to give us different shades of colour throughout the game for all our gems. The other thing we want to do back in looks is show it. So remember we have hidden the original sprite. So at the moment all our uh, gems are hidden. But when it starts as a clone, if you click show, those clones will begin to show up on the, um, on the page. Now to get these gems moving, now that they're set up, we need to go to events and bring out when I receive move. Now you want the gems to fall down the page at the same speed as the road. So it looks like they're actually fixed in the one position. So if they're moving at the same speed as the road, it'll look like they're actually moving with the road. Okay, so when we bring out this when I receive move message, when we get told to move, what we're going to do is go to motion and we're going to change the Y value at the same speed as the road. So in data, you've got road speed. So bring that in and drop it in the box. So we're changing the Y value of our gems to be the same as the road speed. So it's always moving down the page at the same speed as the road. Then we need to work out if the cars have a collision with the gems. So when they collide with the gems, whoops, we want to get some points up here. Okay, so we need some if-then statements. So in control here, let's bring out the if-then statement. And we need to work out from sensing if we're touching, let's start with the red car. So if the gem is touching the red car or the red car has run into the gem, what do we want to do? Well, first thing, we want to play a sound. We've got to reward our players with happy sounds to show that they've done something right. So over in sounds, delete the pop. And let's look for a happy sound. I've used it before. I'm just going to go with fairy dust. Okay, it's that weird little sound. Seems like it's incomplete, but we'll bring it in anyway. Okay, now that we've got um, that in our library, go back to your scripts and bring out the first option to from sound to play the sound fairy dust. After that, we want to get some points. Okay, so in the data tab there, we're going to change, because we're colliding with the red car, we want to change the red car gems by one. So that gives us one point for each gem we hit. Now we also want the countdown timer to be extended if we're playing the game well. Okay, so we're going to change the countdown by one as well. So that just adds one more second to our game time. So we get to play the game for a bit longer. All right, and we also want to make sure that we delete the clone once we've collected it. So just put delete clone or delete this clone underneath it. So as soon as we hit that gem, it will disappear. Okay, so I'm going to right click on this if then statement now and duplicate it and put it straight below. And we're going to do the same code, but just switch the red car to the blue car. So if we're touching the blue car now, we play the sound of the fairy dust. You might want to change the sound so the two cars have different sounds when they collect these gems. That's fine. I'm just going to leave it the same though. And you can change red car gems to blue car gems. So we get one point for the blue car gems this time if the blue car picks up a gem. Countdown will still get one extra second and we'll also delete the clone once it runs into them. Okay. Last thing we want to do is when the gem gets to the bottom of the page and no one's collected it, we've got to delete it. Okay, so we'll just bring in one final if-then statement. And it's going to be a less than that we put in between the if and the then. So the less than operator. So if the gem's Y position, so grab Y position from your motion tab. If its Y position is less than minus 175, which is the bottom of our page, then we'll make it disappear. We'll just delete it. So in control, delete this clone. Okay, simple as that. So that's got our 
gems moving down the page. The only thing we need to do now is go back to our game loop sprite over here. And what we want to do is actually make those gems appear on the screen. At the moment, we've got this little section of code. So when the game actually starts moving, we're creating snowballs. What we want to do now is create gems as well. And it's basically the same code. So just right click on that if then statement and duplicate it and snap it on the bottom. So instead of creating snowballs again, what we're going to do is create gems. Okay. And you might have noticed when we were playing our game earlier that snowballs are very few and far between. They don't appear very often. We actually want these gems to appear a lot more frequently than the snowballs. Okay, so we're going to change the pick random number. We'll go 1 to 20. That means it's 10 times more likely that we're going to see a gem than a snowball. Okay, so we should see a lot more gems on our page. So if we just run that game for a moment, let's have a look and we'll see what's happening. So there's a gem. We can collect it. We can hear sounds. The blue car is good. Let's try this red car. Yeah, it's all good. And you can see up here that the gem totals, I'll make that a bit bigger, the gem totals have gone up. We're also getting one extra second added to our countdown timer each time we collect a gem, which is working like we wanted to. The other thing is, though, the countdown timer is not counting down. Okay, so we should probably do that in this video before we finish up. Okay, so we'll stay in this game loop sprite. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring out another event. It's over here, when I receive calculate. We've already got one up here that says when I receive calculate. But we're going to bring in a second second event there, or second script that says when I receive calculate. And we're going to calculate this timer to make it count down. Okay, so let's bring in an if then statement over here. If then, and we're going to use our operators and use the greater than operator. And what we're going to look for is we're going to look for if the timer, so in sensing, grab the timer, is greater than one. So that means we've still got time on the clock. What we're going to do is start counting down. So in data, we're going to change not blue car gems, we're going to change the countdown by minus one. So that means we'll take one second off our countdown timer. Okay, and eventually we're going to get all the way to the end and we'll reset that timer. What we might do as well, I just had a thought, for the last 10 seconds of the game, we might play a little sound to just um, warn our players that we've only got 10 seconds left and they need to start collecting gems if they want that countdown timer to go up. So we might bring in another if then statement. And what we're going to do is just put it over here for the minute. What we're going to look for in the operators is the less than operator. So it's going to be if our countdown timer or countdown is less than 10. Then we're going to play a sound. Okay, and the sound in our library at the moment is the pop, and that's probably just a good sound. It's a little, yeah, just a little really quick noise. So let's play the sound pop for the last. 10 seconds of our game and just drop that code beneath the reset timer so it's still in the big if then statement it goes just under the reset timer there okay and that will probably play a little pop sound in the last 10 seconds of our game so let's see if we can get our countdown timer we'll try and avoid these gems so we don't collect too many you can see our countdown timer our countdown timer working which is good and each time I collect the gem, we get one second. Yeah, that's working. <laughs> Alrighty, that was a bit crazy there. I was crashing into everything because I wanted that timer to work. But basically, if we go back to game loop here, this code now is working. We've got our countdown timer counting down. And we've also got the pop sound for the last 10 seconds to warn our player that the end of the game is near. Alrighty, so I'm going to stop the video here. I'll see you in the next part where hopefully we'll finish our game off. Okay, there's only a few small final touches that we need to do. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video. I'll see you in the next one.